you have your Bibles with you, we ask you to turn to the Gospel of Luke, chapter 4. The Gospel of Luke, chapter 4. While you're turning there, again, remember each of our missionaries. I remember Brother Downs particularly, that the Lord would continue uh, to bless him. Gospel of Luke, chapter 4, in the first verse. The Bible says, And Jesus, being full of the Holy Ghost, returned from Jordan and was led by the Spirit into the wilderness, being forty days tempted of the devil. And in those days he did, not, he did eat nothing. And when they were ended, he afterward were hungered. And the devil said unto him, If thou be the Son of God, command this stone that it be made bread. Jesus answered him, saying, It is written, Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word of God. And the devil, taking him up into a high mountain, shoot him into all the kingdoms of the world in a moment of time. And the devil said unto him, All power will I give unto thee, and the glory of them, for what is delivered unto me, and to whomsoever I will give it. If thou therefore wilt worship me, all shall be thine. And Jesus answered and said, Get thee behind me, Satan, for, that it, for it is written, Thou shalt worship the Lord thy God, and him only shalt thou serve. And he brought him out to Jerusalem and set him on a pinnacle of the temple, and said unto him, If thou be the Son of God, cast thyself down from hence. For it is written, He shall give his angels charge over thee, to keep thee, and in their hands they shall bear thee up, lest at any time thou shalt dash thy foot against the stone. And Jesus answered and said unto him, It is said, Thou shalt not tempt the Lord thy God. And when the devil had ended all the temptation, he departed from him for a season. Dear Lord, we thank you and we praise you and we give you great glory and honor for who you are this morning. Lord, we thank you for your word and how it teaches us and how it rebukes us and how it encourages us in, your, uh, in the walk that we have with you. Lord God, we pray this morning that you would be with those that are here. Lord, that you would uh, encourage them with your word, that you would thrill their hearts with your presence of the Holy Spirit. Lord, we pray for the lost, Lord, that tonight, today might be the day that you might speak salvation unto them, wake them up to the eternity that lies ahead, the eternity with you, or the eternity without you, God, we pray that you would do that. In the name of Jesus, we pray it. Amen. Now, uh, some fairly familiar verses of scripture, although uh, most of the time you hear it read, and most of the times I've preached it myself, I use Matthew's accounting of the very same thing, but there's one piece of information here, and it's what we're going to look at in a moment, and what will be our emphasis that Luke did not include, I mean, excuse me, that Matthew did not include in his rendition of the very same thing. In the first verse, uh, I find it very interesting, and Jesus being full of the Holy Ghost. Now, uh, he had been baptized uh, with John's baptism and was coming back and was fixing to get his really first encounter as a, as a, with a prayer time along with God. And the Bible says that he was full of the Holy Ghost. Now, that's interesting to me because he was Christ. But it said that he was full of the Holy Ghost. You know, uh, uh, the more I study it, the more I realize this. We're not always full of the Holy Ghost. You know what? My truck's got about a quarter tank in it. And if I take it down here to the pump and fill it back up, it'll be full again. Be ready to go again. Uh, yes, the Holy Ghost abides, but you're not always full. And the reason we're not full is because of us. And, and it's because of our own rebellion. And uh, uh, that's why the Bible says very clearly in the, in the book of James, draw nigh to me and I'll draw nigh unto you. He's not going to put his approval on sin. So very interesting scriptures. And Jesus being full of the Holy Ghost returned from Jordan where he was baptized and was led by the Spirit. And the reason that he was led by the Spirit 
capital S Spirit, the Holy Spirit of God, is that He was full of the Spirit. You know what? If you're running about half empty, I don't know that you can be led of the Spirit. If you're running on about a quarter tank, I don't know that you can do this. And so, because he was full of the Holy Ghost, the Spirit led him and he was obedient under the direction of the Holy Spirit. And again, being part of the Godhead, I'm not sure I can put my mind around it, but that is what the Word of God says. Verse 3, and the devil said, and, uh, I'm sorry, uh, verse 2, being 40 days tempted of the devil... And in those days he did eat nothing, and when they were ended, he afterward were uh, he afterward hungered. Now I want you to see verse two is interesting because again Matthew's account is the very same thing. Uh, it says the devil arrived on the scene afterwards, but in the entirety of the forty days, it said the devil tempted him. And are you hungry, Jesus? You want something to eat? You've already been fasting five days. I know that belly's empty. Approaching him through the flesh. And that's what he does. That's what he's good at. It, it, it's coming to you on terms of the flesh. And so he wasn't isolated and by himself. Uh, as always, the great hinderer was there. The one that caused problems was, was present. And uh, really, from what I can see from verse 2, bothered him the whole time. Verse 3. And the devil said unto him, If thou be the Son of God, command this stone that it be made bread. Now, I want you to see another thing that the devil was not really questioning who God was, who Jesus was. He wanted, he wanted Jesus to question it. See, there's nothing any more greater of uh, glory for him to have you question your salvation, to question your relationship with Christ, to question who you are in him, to question this and question that. So uh, I also think it's interesting that it says it initially identifies him as a devil. And in verse 2 it says, and the devil. Now, I don't know if Satan uh, was there the whole time or if Satan saw him at his weakness because it'll soon start calling him Satan specifically. Now, let me say this. There are many imps and demons and devils out there. And what they want, if you're redeemed, is they want your testimony. They want to bring you down as just as low as you can be. They want, you to, they want to cause you to compromise what you've stood for. That is their enjoyment, is to bring you down. And so I don't know if it was a number of devils. I don't know if it... Uh, if one of the devils that came and said, hey, you know, Satan, uh, Jesus is weak. And then Satan showed up. Or I don't know if it was Satan the whole time. I don't know. I'm just saying the wording is different. But I'll say this. When you're at your weakness, Satan will show up. Now, uh, as modern day people, I don't even know if we merit Satan's authority. Uh, I don't know if he'd take time to fool with us. But I will say this, if you have a means to, uh, if you have a mind to follow the things of God, then he may. If you have a mind to be obedient to scriptures, he may give you the trouble that he did the Lord Jesus Christ. Verse 4, and Jesus answered him saying, it is written that, the, that man shall not live by bread alone, but, at, but by every word of God. Now, in other words, the priority of this life is not meals. The priority of this life is not being rich. The, pro or the priority of this life is simply the Word of God and understanding the Word of God and taking the Word of God for what it says and not what someone else says about it. You know what? Listening to even a good Baptist preacher about what they just say is nothing more than popery. Study it yourself. Look at it yourself. Dig yourself. Because you know what? What I have found is men can make mistakes. And, and, and so we as the Lord's people, he said, uh, the, the Lord Jesus answered him saying, the word of God is, 
uh, what is important, verse uh, 5, and the devil taking him up onto a high mountain showed him all the kingdoms of the world in a moment. And the devil said unto him, All power will I give thee and the glory of them. And notice that little bitty phrase, for that it was delivered unto me. Um, now, if he was lying to the Lord Jesus Christ, or Satan has this authority already. Um, you go into very big cities and you'll be convinced that the devil has it. Um, Memphis, Tennessee is one of the most vile places you'll find in our entire country. And, 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 and when you look at it in that sense, you'll be very convinced that this statement was true. Now, the devil being a liar, the Bible says he was a liar from the beginning. Maybe he was just saying, hey, I've got this power. And maybe he really didn't. I don't know, but I do know this, that this is his dominion for, uh, for, for now. And one day he will even have more and he'll take over the, uh, the entirety of it. Verse 7, if thou therefore will worship me, it all shall be thine. And Jesus answered and said unto him, Get thee behind me, Satan. And I want you to see that the first one that identified him for who he was, the rest of the scripture causes him, calls him a devil. And he says, Get thee behind me, Satan, for it is written, Thou shalt worship the Lord thy God, and him only shalt thou worship. Now, Another thing that we're fixing to see that Matthew's gospel doesn't quite cover is he didn't leave. When he said the very same thing in Matthew's gospel, which was the third rebuke, Satan left. Here he doesn't. Um, you know, uh, <laughs> Satan's going to keep trying with you. Satan's going to keep digging. Satan's going to keep discouraging you to the, mo to, the, uh, to, the, to the very most of his ability. And listen, this is God's son. This is the man that had dominion over Satan himself, and he kept trying anyway. And he, meaning Satan, brought him, meaning Jesus, to Jerusalem and set him on the pinnacle of the temple. Now, I find this very interesting as well. Why, why is this interesting? Jared, was there a temple at Jerusalem at this time? Not really. The pinnacle of the temple took him to the very top. And so I don't know if it was a spiritual thing or if it was a real thing. And said, cast thyself down. Throw thyself down. I know it will be gone completely in 70 years. And, 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 and so he was attacking the Lord Jesus Christ from carnal standpoint and he's going to attack you from the carnal standpoint. He's going to attack you through the flesh. He's going to attack you through the things you like. He's going to attack you through your weaknesses and that was his attempt on Christ. Get the, uh, and, and he brought and he uh, and he brought him to Jerusalem and set him on the pinnacle of the temple and said unto him, If thou be the Son of God, cast thyself down from hence. For it is written, He shall give, thee, uh, give his angels charge over thee to keep thee, and in their hands they shall bear thee up, lest at any time thou shalt dash thy foot against the stone. And Jesus answering said, it, it said, said unto him, It is said, Thou shalt not tempt the Lord thy God. And when the devil had ended all the temptation, he departed him for a season. Now, this is the thing. You may be on the mountaintop this morning, but the devil will be back. In a season, and that's different for different people, in a time, Satan's going to come back. Now, this is the thing. What are you going to do in the season? 
What are you going to do in your time of break? Now, I don't know about you, but uh, I don't get many breaks. I don't get many times when the devil is not trying to hinder me some. But in that, in, in that brief time, we should be about our knees in prayer. We should be about our, our, our study into the Word of God. Because, you know, how did, what was the, what was the Lord's defense every time? It's the Word of God. Now, how can you possibly defend yourself against the power of Satan if you don't know that book? You know, uh, you don't want to be left unarmed. We live in a very, very strange day. Uh, I never had a gun much when kids were growing up. Now I have three. And uh, the reason why, you just don't know what's going to happen. That's the reality of it. And how, uh, uh, the second time my house was broke into, you know what? Then I got uh, a pistol. And, you know, this is the reality of it. You don't know when Satan is going to show back up. So you be ready for it. You be prepared. You be, because listen, th th this is the reality of it. Most of the time, we're not. And then we wonder why it all works out so bad. Why, they, why, 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 didn't, why, why didn't I have a better victory? You know, Pentecostal people are always talking about living in the victory. That, that's one of their catch terms. You know what? There's something to that. Now, not like they mean it. But there's something to living in the victory. And we don't do it. We live in defeat. And we're certainly not prepared for the battle. We're, we're certainly not ready for the next time the, the, that Satan comes his way wielding a weapon at us. We're, uh, we're, we're, we're not ready. We're not prepared to do that. Now, if you will... Uh, uh, go with me to the Gospel of Luke chapter 22. Now some of the items that we're going to look at today, many people will say, well, God's sovereign. Well, I understand that He is, and I give Him great glory and honor He is for that He is, but don't you use that as excuse. Gospel of Luke chapter 22 in the very first verse. Uh, the Bible says this, Now the feast of unleavened bread drew nigh, which is called the Passover. And the chief priests and the scribes sought how they might kill him, meaning Christ, and they, uh, for they feared the people. Then entered Satan into Judas, servant named Iscariot. Now, this is one of the few times. Now, listen, there's a lot of demonic possession. The maniac, the maniac of Gadara, uh, the Bible says uh, of Mary Magdalene, of whom seven devils were cast out. Uh, demonic possession is real. But I believe this is the only time you'll find in your King James Bible, it says that Satan entered an individual. And it was Judas Iscariot. Now, I personally believe Judas was lost. I think he had no hope. Uh, uh, the Bible says this, that he was a devil from the beginning. In, I think Matthew chapter 7. And, and, and he really had no hope. But see, uh, Satan actually physically entered Judas Iscariot. You know what? That should make the hair stand up on our head. And we read it and just keep right on going. Now, do you not believe that's still a possibility? Well, you, you better because the Antichrist is coming. Uh, the reality of it happening again is very, very real. Now, I believe we'll be gone by that point, but I believe we'll be... I, I, I think we could easily see his predecessor, which is going to be a voice piece for him, much unlike to John the Baptist was for Christ... And there's one coming on the scene very, very soon that will do that. And then this demonic Satan incarnate is going to uh, appear on the scene. And it's going to literally take the world by storm. Everybody's going to follow him. 
And so it's a very significant thing this morning when, when, when we consider the seriousness of Satan literally entering in to an individual. And the chief priests and the scribes saw how they might kill him, for they feared the, feared the people. Then entered Satan unto Judas, surnamed Iscariot, being of the number of the twelve, and he went his way. Now, who was the last person that was mentioned as far as an action? We get back to some English classes. There's two individuals. There was Satan. Second one was Judas Iscariot. So the he in that statement must be Satan. And the second one must be Judas Iscariot. So Judas Iscariot went Satan's way. Fully possessed, fully controlled. And we know that he went out and betrayed our Lord and, and coveted for 30 pieces of silver and, and, and set the whole thing up. And then after it was said and done, you know what? Satan left him high and dry and he went and he took his own life. You know what? Satan one day is going to leave you high and dry too. It, it, he's going to leave you empty. All these little devils. And you know what? We, we think we're exempt from the influence of devils because we're redeemed. No, no. We're exempt from possession of devils because the Bible says we are sealed unto the day of redemption. But they will influence you. They will tempt you. They come in hundreds and hundreds of, uh, 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 of forms. Alcohol, drugs, pornography, clothes, makeup, Cars, trucks. We don't think about those, do we? Yeah. And, and, and so we as the Lord's people, we we need to certainly uh, we we need to certainly evaluate what's influencing our lives on a on a routine basis. Now in this same chapter, Luke 22, drop down to verse 31, and the Bible says this. This is when uh, Simon Peter had said, I'll never leave you nor forsake you. And the Lord said, Simon, Simon, behold, Satan hath desired to have you that he may sift you as wheat. Now, if you don't know what sifting of wheat is, you'll miss the, the message in this verse. Um, the hull is the outside. And Satan wanted to rub it off and get to the meat of the wheat, get to the meat of Peter, which was on the inside. Now, and I think that he did. I think that uh, Satan beat him up enough that on that third time he threw a cushion fit and said, I don't know the man. And then the Bible says that he went out and wept bitterly. See, Satan accomplished his purpose. And you're talking about the second man, the one that was right with God. The only one closer to him than Jesus was John. And that very individual was sifted as we. A lot of people said, oh, oh, he didn't get to accomplish this because Jesus prayed for him. Yes, he most certainly did get it accomplished. You throw a custom fit and say, I don't know Jesus. I don't know how much more sifted you could be. Right? Now, we find then that Satan has a plan. Satan, if you make a stand for the Lord Jesus, Satan has a plan for you. He has an attack whenever he wants to. And the more that you do for the cause of Christ, the more that he desires to take you out. Uh, the book of Acts. Acts chapter 5. Now, um, now the Lord Jesus uh, has been resurrected. He's gone back home to be with his Father in heaven. And the New Testament church is growing very rapidly. Acts chapter 5, in the first verse, the Bible says this, But a certain man named Ananias, with Sapphira, his wife, sold a possession and kept back part of the prize, his wife also being privy to it, and brought a certain part, and laid it at the apostles' feet. Now, I want you to see here, up to this point, 
There was nothing wrong whatsoever with what Ananias and Sapphira had done. They were fine with it. It was their property. They could do whatever they wanted to with it. But they wanted to look big and bad in the church. Now, listen, the worst thing that we can do is to desire some big position or some kind of big uh, status in the church. You know what that is? That's carnal. You know why the Southern Baptists had a superintendent of the Sunday school uh, in every Southern Baptist church so somebody can look big and bad? You know why they have annual elections for their pastors and their Sunday school teachers? It's because someone can look big and bad. You know why they buy a, and vote on the piano player? So someone can look all lottie da in front of the assembly. You know what? All that is is pride. Every bit of it is nothing but pride. And we find here that very, very early in the New Testament church that that was a very uh, real problem. And so Ananias and Sapphira uh, made their little plan and they carried it out. Verse 3. But Peter said, Ananias, why has Satan filled thine heart? I think that's a fair question. Now, a lot of people say, well, the next one to be Satan possessed will be the Antichrist. Well, the Bible says there that Ananias was. You know how long the Lord had been gone? You know how long Judas had been gone? Less than a year. Less than a year. And we find Satan possessing, it says, possessed. Filled his heart inside him. Why have Satan filled thy heart, Ananias? Well, there's an answer to that. You know what? Number one, Ananias was lost, and so was Sapphira. Because, again, he can't enter the redeemed, but he can enter, but he can enter uh, anybody else. Anybody else that's not saved, if they're, if they're young, they're old, they're whatever they may be, you know what? They're open game unto Satan. And so we find then that Ananias, the reason that he did it was twofold. Number one, that he's lost. And number two, that he was, he was filled with Satan. That, that literally Satan had encompassed him. Another thing he says, to lie to the Holy Ghost. So he was Satan possessed and he lied to the Holy Ghost. You know what? You can lie to me this morning. You can tell me anything that you want to. And because I am, if you're, if you're, a, if you're a child of God, I tend to believe anybody. Say you, that you're born again, I tend to believe you. But it says here that he lied, attempted to lie to the Holy Ghost. You know what? You, you, you can't do that. You can't pretend to be happy when you're sad. You can't pretend to be close when you're far. You can't pretend to be happy when you're sad. That's lying to the Holy Ghost. And we as the Lord's people, we need to be truthful. You know what? You're going to have ups and downs. You're not going to be happy every day. You're going to have problems. And you know what? Instead of lying about it and, and thinking that you're on, you know, on cloud nine, why don't you just tell the truth and say, hey, church, I need some help. I, I need some prayer. And, and, and so we find then uh, that Ananias had done two things, and one of them was an attempt to, to uh, lie to God himself in the person of the Holy Ghost and to keep back part of the price of the land. Whilst it remained, was it not in thine own hand? And after it was sold, was it not in thine own power or authority? Why hast thou conceived this thing in thine heart? Now, Ananias, he didn't really have time. I don't know that he ever got to think this one out because he's fixing to bite the dust. But you know what? I think, why has he done it? He was lost. Why did he do it? He hated God. Why did he do it? He wanted to live big and bad in front of the church. Why did he do it? His nature had never, ever, ever been changed. That's why he did it. And so we find then as the Lord's people, 
that uh, a lot of the times the reason that we're not prepared why <laughs> why Satan gets that second attack why he comes back again and again is that <laughs> we're open game. And Ananias, hearing these things, fell down and gave up the ghost. And great fear came upon all of them that heard these things. So why wasn't Ananias prepared for the attack of Satan? I believe Ananias' base problem was this, he was lost. You ever seen somebody that, well, I never, ever thought they'd do that. I never, ever thought they leave the church. I never ever thought you'd see her running around like that. I never ever thought you'd see them drinking beer. Well, you know what? This is the thing. <laughs> Satan's got him. Satan attacked him. Satan did what he does best. And, and so we as the Lord's people... Uh, <laughs> If you get attacked, and if you get, or I say this, when you get attacked, and when you get fatigued, listen, be ready, because another attack is coming when he gets you fatigued down to nothing. Uh, uh, another attack is right around the corner, and uh, uh, and are you ready? Second Corinthians, Second Corinthians, chapter number two. 2 Corinthians 2 and verse 7. 2 Corinthians 2 and verse 7, the Bible says this, So that counterwise, you ought rather to forgive him and comfort him, lest perhaps such a, uh, such a one should be swallowed up with over much sorrow. Talking of forgiving people. Talking of, uh, 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 of encouraging people encouraging them. Verse 8. Wherefore I beseech you or beg you that you would confirm your love toward him. Now, we're talking about somebody fixing to be attacked and be ready, and now we're talking about your role. If you're prayed up, if you're, if you're prepared, if you're studying in the scripture when Satan comes by, but what about your neighbor that sits in the pew beside you and they're not ready and you know they're not ready and you know what the first inclination is, is to make fun of them. You know what? Uh, people are not born knowing that book in your lap. People are not born understanding complicated doctrines such as election and predestination. People are not born understanding the Holy Ghost. And so, when you see somebody struggling, pray for them. Because you know what? The attack, if a lion is following elk or some other uh, type of kind, which one does he go for? The cripple and the hawk, right? One that's your very, very back. And we tend to want to kick people while they're down, don't we? And, and, and so as Paul is writing to the church of Corinth on the second time around, and apparently he's still seeing some of these problems, he says, you need to encourage them. You need to give them some help. Verse 9, For to this end also did I write that I may know the proof or the evidence of you, whether you be obedient in all things, to whom you forgive anything, I forgive also. For I get, for I, I, for if I forgave anything, to whom I forgave it for your sakes, forgive it to the, that person in Christ, lest Satan should get an advantage of us, for we are not ignorant of his devices. Now, I want you to notice two things. Talking about forgiveness and talk about forgetting. We just don't do it. And ladies, excuse me, but y'all are the very worst for it. I mean, Donna can tell, she, she can't remember when we lived in Dresden. 
but she could tell me if, if I said something out of the way in October the 12th, 1988, I mean, she can flip it right out there. You see what I'm saying? We need to forgive. And then we need to forget. The, you know what the Bible says concerning our own sin? That he's cast it into the depths of the sea. So why can't we be the same way? When someone new comes into the group, why do we look at them so special compared to, you know, want to know their genealogy back to the Lord that came in flesh? Did it matter? And, and, and so we as the Lord's people, what we need to do and what we need to understand is that Christ forgive us and we should forgive them. And why? Because if we don't, Satan is going to get advantage. And notice what it says. It's not, he's not going to get an advantage on them. It said that he'd get an advantage on us. You. The non-forgiver. The one that won't, uh, won't forgive them and forget their trespass. That individual is the one, the Bible just says, that Satan will take, uh, will take advantage of, will bring him down. And huh, then... Paul says this, for we are not ignorant of his devices, plural. Now, what does it mean to be ignorant? It simply means that you don't know, right? You, you, you've never been exposed to it. Now, there's one thing to be stupid, and that uh, the Bible calls it a fool, is what the Bible calls it. And that is knowing to do something and deliberately doing the opposite. That, that's being a fool or that's being stupid. But being, being ignorant is quite another thing. That just means you've never been exposed to it. That means you simply do not know. And Paul says, I'm not ignorant of his devices. But there are a lot of people that are. You know, I hear that I heard this, uh, I heard this uh, misquoted the other day at work, and my whole body cringed. Uh, money is the root of all evil. No, it's not. The love of money is the. You know what? You got to have money to live. Yeah. You know, I I can't go around and find people who need nursing care and trade it out for some potatoes. I just have to find. And earn my money and go buy the potatoes at the, at the grocery store. So no, money certainly isn't the root of all evil, but loving it is. And what we need to understand and know, you know what? That's one of Satan's devices. The love of this world is one of Satan's devices. Settling in to stay indefinitely is one of Satan's devices. Ye are pilgrims and strangers. Right? Satan's devices. And, and so, uh, if you're ignorant of him, the next time he comes around and hits you blindsided from the left side, you won't be prepared for him because you didn't see the attack coming in the first place. Don't be ignorant. Read this book. Involve yourself in study. Dig down in it and find what his next hit is going to be. Last place I'm going to read this morning is 2 Thessalonians, excuse me, 1 Thessalonians chapter 2. 1 Thessalonians. First Thessalonians chapter 2 and just, I'm going to just read verse 18. Wherefore, we would have come unto you, even I, Paul, once and again, but Satan... Hindered us. Now I want you to notice two things. Number one, do you believe Paul was saved? And I hope you say yes. A very good record uh, of his uh, salvation as his, on his Damascus Road adventure. He was going down there to rip the church apart at Damascus. And the Lord intervened and saved his soul. He was never the same again. He preached the gospel for the entirety of the rest of his life until the day that he died for it. And that individual said to the church at Thessalonica, I've tried to get there before, but Satan hindered me. 
Satan got in my way. Satan, uh, <laughs> Satan uh, changed my course. So what about you? Now, if Paul could be hindered by Satan, certainly we can too. Now, that's with all your ducks in a row. That's with everything, and you're prepared for his attack. You've defended the attack. You weren't blindsided. You weren't hit with an onslaught. You were completely ready, and Satan hindered you anyway. You know what it is a very difficult thing to do? Is to walk when you're blind. Because you don't, and I believe Paul was about as near blind as you can get without being blind. How many people, probably me and Junior and Diane and Donna, is the only one that remembers this, and Donna may not. But there used to be an old blind fella that walked around town down here. And when he found somebody, he would take, place his hand on your shoulder and you would walk him across the street so he could be saved. And he, was down, he worked somewhere. He still worked. I don't know how he managed to work and be blind, but he worked at one of the offices in town. But he, was, he didn't feel like he was safe. You'd think that that was probably Paul's hindrance because he'd have to get somebody to take him. He'd have to get somebody to bring him down to Thessalonica and, and to preach to the believers there. So something very simple could be your hindrance. But more often than not, instead of a hindrance, what we have is an attack. We, we, we have, we, we're onslaughted and we're just not prepared. How well do you know the scripture this morning? Could you answer Satan with the word of God? Could you answer an attack and say, this is what the Lord says? And you know, the worst thing that we can do is be unsure of the word of God. You know what? If you don't know what the scripture says, just keep your mouth shut. Just don't say nothing at all. Are you, are you prepared? Are you, are you ready for the next attack?